Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of The Subnet Show. I am your host, Gabriel Cardona. This evening, Connor Daly is out. He is uh, busy working on a very exciting release coming up on our NFT platform, which we've talked about previously in the past, Avalanche being the premier location for launching licensed NFTs and the amount of amazing work that Connor has done there. So there's a huge release that's getting ready to happen. And unfortunately, he was unable to uh, get pulled away from that this evening since he's the lead on that project. So I'm going to be rocking this one solo. Tonight, we have a really, really special guest. So tonight joining us is Aaron Buckwald. Aaron is on the platform team at Ava Labs, and he is the lead developer or the lead engineer on Core ETH. Core ETH is basically our instance of the Ethereum virtual machine. We call um, the virtual machine Core ETH, and we call the blockchain uh, the C chain. Aaron can correct me if I'm wrong there. But basically, this is our version of the EVM, but instead of Nakamoto consensus, it has Snowman consensus. I'll let uh, Aaron deep dive on that. But welcome to the show, Aaron. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, glad to be here. Thanks for having me, Gabriel. Yeah, so as I mentioned, Aaron is on the platform team and he is the lead developer on the C chain. And the C chain has been absolutely huge. Uh, the way the Avalanche ecosystem and architecture works is we have this notion of subnets and then within the subnets we have uh, virtual machines. And the virtual machine is basically like the application level logic of a blockchain. And when you instantiate it, it's called a blockchain. So you can think about it if you're familiar with object oriented programming, it's like a class and an instance, right? At least that's the way I phrase it. Again, Aaron, please correct me where I steer off the path. And so Core ETH is our fork of Geth. Again, I'm gonna rely on Aaron to school me here. And then the instance of Geth running on our network or the Core ETH is called the C chain. That's our smart contract chain. And it has been incredibly successful out of the three blockchains we have, the P chain, the C chain and the X chain. I would for sure say that the bulk of the juice and the bulk of the excitement is happening on the C chain. We've had a ton of projects which have ported over from uh, other EVM ecosystems like uh, Ethereum and the Binance chain and others. And we've just had an explosion recently of total value locked now and like the billions of dollars and just tons and tons of exciting stuff. And really Aaron's work has been at the heart of all of that. So I hold Aaron in incredibly high esteem. I think of him as an absolute block star um, I hope that he appreciates how important his work has been. So traditionally, um, the way this plays out is we like to get a sense of people's crypto journey. So, you know, how did they find software? How did they ultimately end up working on the blockchain and working at all the labs? Then we talk about what their project has actually been. So in this particular case, C chain, the ups and the downs, the good, the bad, the ugly, you know, what have we done well? What will we do different if you could redo it? And then we wrap it up with just what is your crypto vision? How do you see this playing out? Where is this in the future? So I think in that context, um, let's just start at the beginning. So um, how did you end up uh, in software? What was your path that brought you to software? Sure. I think the, uh, the first way that I ended up in software was, you know, I took classes way back in middle school. I went to a camp where I was trying to build a website at a time when I had no idea how to build a website and completely failed to build a website. But, you know, I had that interest uh, very far back, I took different classes in high school, you know, AP computer science and so on. Um, and the first real project that I started to work on that was, you know, outside of just classwork um, was basically this idea. I, I was very into finance at the time. I was the president of uh, the investing club of my high school. Um, and so the idea was fantasy football meets the stock market. Um, and, you know, we had all these members in the club who they were trying to create their portfolios just on market watch. And they would all put their money into Apple, Facebook, you know, things that they knew, and they had no idea how to size their investments. So everyone just poured their money to that, and you know, no one was learning anything. So me and a friend of mine had the idea to um, basically build a website to make it more like fantasy football. So there's more of a comparison that you have to make between them, uh, where you know you're going to be comparing Apple versus Facebook and deciding, okay, I want to draft Apple instead of Facebook because I think that its price to earnings ratio is, is better right now. It has more upside or something like that. Um, so I started trying to build that. I got an investment from a guy I met on a train, actually. Uh, Michael Klisk is an absolutely great guy. So I'll, I'll send him this link later. Um, but, you know, so that was my first project. And that was at a time when, again, I didn't have that much experience. And we weren't able to uh, quite finish that website. But uh, that was my first uh, real experiment with entrepreneurship and, you know, trying to build new things. And I really started to fall in love with it then. Uh, the first uh, time that I worked on a more successful st uh, startup or a project was I got a job in Germany with uh, Cognigy AI, which was a conversational AI company. Um, 
and I joined them uh, in, I guess it was December of 20, 2017 and worked for them for a little while until the end of my freshman year of college. Um, and they were, you know, great conversation at a company. They actually just raised another round very recently. So shout out to them too. Uh, great team out there. And they, you know, mentored me as I was starting to learn the ropes a little bit. They were a team that worked largely in TypeScript. So I got to learn a little bit of TypeScript, which I, I don't get to use anymore. Um, but, you know, it was a great engineering team. And it was great to be part of that organization. It really kind of solidified my idea that I wanted to study computer science and go into software development. Um, and so at that point, I just changed my mind from studying economics and government, which was what I had originally kind of planned for uh, when going to college to deciding that I wanted to study computer science. I just kind of fell in love with the idea that instead of, I don't know, working in finance or something like that, where I felt less of a connection to what was being built, to the value that I was bringing to the world, I felt like in software development, uh, creating things, and not just software development, but really like the broader field of engineering, just this idea of creating things that have a, potential, a potentially tangible impact, uh, just I that very much resonated with me, and so I kind of fell in love with it and decided to to move on from there. Uh, then I started working in a, a spacecraft research lab uh, for a little bit as well, working on flight software for a, a satellite that was going to be launched aboard Artemis One. So that was a uh, cislunar explorers. Uh, so shout out to them too. And and I ended up uh, meeting Goon and the Ava Labs team through Philip Liu, who was one of our earliest people on the VD team. He was in a club uh, that I had been in at Cornell, and so we sent an email reaching out and. You know, I, I, I think they were looking to hire people for their for their BD team to help out with some funds that we were raising at the time. Uh, so I sent in my resume and at that point had a decent amount of technical experience and not very much financial experience that I ended up being hired as, a, as an engineer at that point. I think I was the fourth engineer on the team uh, and I've been with Ava Labs ever since. And, uh, you know, just learned, you know, I mean, rewinding just a couple of steps, getting to that point, I already kind of fell in love with the idea of, of building things. And at that point, you know, joining that team of, you know, Steven, I was working very closely with uh, Ted, I was working very closely with and Sylvain Bellamy, who's no longer with the team I was working very closely with. And it was just, I couldn't have found a better place to be a better room full of people to be the dumbest person in the room. And trust me, I was by far the dumbest person in the room at that point in time. And, you know, it was, uh, it was a great place. And, you know, that's something that I had always known that was a good thing to be, to be the dumbest person in the room. Um, and I found, you know, one of the greatest places to, to do that is just an incredibly smart team being surrounded by very successful PhDs that have done some very, uh, very innovative research um, and are beyond just the research that they've done very, uh, very knowledgeable about the broader field of distributed systems. And to be able to come in at that point and learn from them, um, not only the broader distributed systems field a little bit, but also just software engineering practices, especially Sylvain. Uh, at that point, you know, I had done a couple of projects, but wouldn't say that I was the best with Git. And so then Bellamere was just an absolute Git wizard. And by the end of working with him, I was, I, I've become a little bit of the Git wizard at Ava Labs for one or two things that have come up. So, uh, you know, it was just, just uh, talking with him and talking with Ted, who obviously was uh, an author on the Avalanche and Libre, uh, um, Hot Stuff papers, you know, it's just a great place to learn. And, you know, uh, beyond that, since we have continued to build the team out, it's been a fantastic place to continue to learn. And, a really cool moment for me was at a certain point, I realized, you know, I'm actually teaching people a little bit now too. You know, I've, I've gathered some of the knowledge about this and it's, yeah, it's been an amazing experience to, to go that full way from thriving on being the dumbest person in the room to being able to give back a little bit to the Ava Labs team and, you know, helping people get on board and everything. And yeah, it's been a wild experience. Wow. So much there for me to unpack. Uh, yeah, he was the dumbest person in the room until I showed up. No. <laughs> I don't know about any of that. <laughs> so like very back in the very beginning, yeah. so you were into finance and economics before software. Was that something you learned from your parents or where did you pick that passion up at a young age? I think I probably picked that up from my dad. He was an economics major. So uh, going and, you know, I was uh, I was a little bit entrepreneurial and wanted to, to make some money. So funny story, going all the way back to the sixth grade, I uh you know, probably whatever my search history was indicated I was looking up, you know, how to make money from a lemonade stand, how to start your own business, stuff like that, you know, stuff more entrepreneurial than financial. Uh, but then because of looking up those things, I found all of these penny stock ads. So I got it in my head that I could be a very successful penny stock investor, which was not true. I was, I was never a very successful penny stock investor. But um, then that kind of uh, led to an interest in economics because my dad having studied economics and knowing what I didn't know at the time, which was I was not going to be a successful penny stock investor wanted me to at least learn something before he let me, you know, set up uh, an account. Uh, so he encouraged me to take some kind of economics course. And 
when I was in sixth grade, I actually ended up taking a, an econ course from UC Berkeley on iTunes U. Uh, and then ever since then, I was really interested in economics. And it was always fun to be the, the kid in history class who would start talking about economic point of views <laughs> when nobody else in the teacher would just kind of look at me like a crazy person, which of course I was, to be fair. Um, but yeah, and then since then, I was interested in the stock market uh, and economics. And, you know, I always had that, uh, that try to do something entrepreneurial to create things and start businesses. And so uh, that was kind of how I led into economics and finance, and then very naturally back into entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial visions and engineering and, you know, building and creating things. Wow, that was rad, man. So then uh, what does your dad think if he was in economics and finance? How does he feel about you building the Internet of Finance? He feels great about it. Um, so he studied economics, but he actually worked at the State Department. Um, so he didn't actually do anything in that field, really. But he's, uh, he's, he's above the age of 60 now, so he doesn't have the best grasp of everything that's going on. Uh, but I try to explain RSA encryption every time I go home from college, and we have the same conversation. And I think he's, he's making progress, I'll say. He's, he's doing well with it. Um, so, you know, I always try to explain it to him, which is, it's just fun. He's, you know, interested in it. It's a little bit hard to grasp, but, you know, I think he has uh, an idea of how influential the things that we're building are now. And, you know, so it's very cool to be able to talk to him about it, you know, try to explain it. Not that I've been that successful with him yet, but. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome, man. That's really cool to hear. Um, do you remember whenever you were building the very first site that was like Fantasy League meets investment with startups? Do you remember what mm -hmm. tech you were using? Yeah, we, we had no idea what we were doing. So we started out in Java. We started out, we didn't know what a database was at the time. So we started out reading text files with Java because that was what we had learned how to do. We had no idea of anything like Django or like any, I mean, we didn't know what like, now we're working on c 3 We didn't know what MongoDB or SQL DB is were at the time. You know, this was like in the middle of AP computer science class that we, we hadn't reached anything like that. So we were literally trying to originally program it purely in Java. We didn't even know how we were going to do the front end at the very beginning. And eventually we switched to, to doing some work with Django and Python, um, but we never quite finished anything there. It was, uh, you know, a project we started in high school. And uh, then, you know, my, uh, the person I was working with, Gravi Knoxville, went off to, to Carnegie Mellon uh, and the Northwestern, and I went off to, to Germany and then Cornell. You know, it's one of those things where it wasn't something that we were 100% committed to at the time. So as soon as we had all these other things to do, uh, we kind of, it, it tailed off a little bit and we didn't stay invested in it. So we never made it too far. Got it. That's pretty awesome. So you were just reading flat files. That's amazing. Yeah, we were reading. We had a CSV file management system. It was great. It 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 could read CV, CSV files, that's for sure. But it was not. Uh, we we hadn't planned on scaling it out that much at that point. Uh, <laughs> tell you that much. So how did you end up at Cornell? Uh, so my dad went to Cornell. My brother went to Cornell. My cousin went to Cornell. Uh, so it wasn't exactly. Uh, it wasn't exactly out of nowhere. <laughs> Um, but so, you know, I, I decided to apply early decision and it's a, it's a fantastic school. I knew that it had a great engineering school and I was looking for something that, you know, would have some engineering stuff there. Uh, I knew that Cornell was, was much better than some of the other schools I was looking at. I was, I'm from Virginia. So I was looking at UVA, uh, which was a fantastic school as well. And to me, one of the big differentiators was Cornell had a much better engineering school, even though they were comparable in economics, business and things like that. Um, so, you know, I applied, got in and here I am, uh, it was, uh, I visited my brother a couple of times and it's, uh, it's a great place to be. It's really fun and there are great people here. So I'm very happy to be here. And obviously yeah. I've met Goon and had lots of opportunities here that have led to fantastic things I can't imagine I would have had at any other school. Yeah, I think Cornell is one of our secret powers, obviously. Absolutely. Um, yeah, Goon um, and then also um, Ted is a PhD, Kevin is a PhD. You're there, Dan yep. was there, was from there. We just happen to have a ton of deal flow for lack of a better word engineering <laughs> which is like yeah. a special power because when you're building a startup in any team in any company your single mm -hmm. asset is really your people like technology yeah. matters, branding matters money matters all those things matter but none of it matters if you don't have a team that can build it and if you have the right team you have people who are entrepreneurial and people who are visionary and people who are hardworking and creative and all of these things and there's obviously a very very high level of talent that comes out of cornell and because we have so many power players that are from Cornell, we just are able to get a ton of great engineers. I don't remember what the number is. I said nine before, but after I said that, I felt like that was too many. Yeah, that's, I feel like that might be low, actually. We have a handful of PhDs uh, that are coming mm -hmm. from Cornell, and then the uh, overall count of engineers and teammates oh, yeah. is probably relatively high. So 
you mentioned Philip Liu. He's the head of strategy and operations. He's also a total champion. I love Philip. If you see this, you're awesome. Philip. So um, you can you walk me through that one more time? How did Philip uh, lead you to working with Goon? Is that what you said? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so Philip was in a, a finance club that I'm in on campus, uh, Cornell Finance Club. So, you know, shout out to them, too. Uh, so he sent an email when they were recruiting a couple of people for the, the BD team at that point. I think that was primarily looking for people to help out with uh, raising that first round or maybe it was the second round at that point. Um, so I, I saw that email and I had actually heard of Ava Labs already at that point. I had seen the initial article that came out, you know, Ava Labs exit stealth mode with some amount of money, whatever it is. And I had actually, you know, been very interested in doing computer science research. So I'd already looked up uh, Goon at that point and, you know, thought about trying to reach out to him. Uh, but I saw on his LinkedIn, he said he wasn't accepting uh, any more connection requests because he was uh, so busy at the time. So <laughs> I figured that was going to be a long shot. Um, but, you know, so I, I responded to that. I, I knew about the article already. I had watched a video of Goon presenting on the consensus protocol, that uh, the Avalanche consensus protocol. Um, and was familiar with some of the other research he had done and thought he would be a very, very cool, interesting person to work with and some research. So I, you know, immediately responded saying I was very interested in talking a little bit about why I was interested in blockchain and Avalanche consensus. Um, and, you know, from there, I, I talked with Philip and I talked with Goon and yeah, I was, uh, I was pretty much the story. I ended up getting a, an awesome position. Yeah, very cool. So what is it like at Cornell? Um, how do people feel about all the labs at Cornell having it's we're pretty relatively successful, I would think, for the amount of time we've been around. And obviously, Goon is a legend. See, I am from the blockchain industry. I don't even have a college degree. I actually dropped out of college to go work in San Francisco and then was doing blockchain stuff probably 13 months later. And so um, I wonder, being on the ground at Cornell, what do people think about all the labs? What do people think about Goon? I think. Uh, it depends on whether or not they're informed about it, right? I think there are some people that are investing in crypto, but they might not necessarily know about, uh, you know, that many different coins. They'll know Bitcoin, Ethereum, and they know that there's other stuff that exists, but they're not that familiar with it. So I think probably the majority of Cornell doesn't know how great the, the, the blockchain community is at Cornell. And part of that is changing with the Cornell Blockchain Club, which I think Goon and John were both actually advisors for way back when. And another person from Cornell, Joe Farrar, was at, at who's now at Ava Labs, he actually founded it back in the day. Um, so there's a pretty large number of people in that. Um, and they're a little bit influential in like leading the dynamic on campus and people know a little bit more if they take a class with the Cornell Blockchain Club or if they join it. But most people, I would say they don't really know just how great, uh, you know, Goon is, just how, how famous Goon is within the crypto community or that much about Ava Labs. I think there was an article in the Daily Sun, a friend of mine actually wrote it last year. I think he spoke with Goon. Uh, they did a little interview. Um, for me personally, working at Ava Labs for the past, you know, two and a half years, all of my friends know about it because I basically disappeared from their lives for a long period of time, um, being, you know, uh, relatively busy. So they were, you know, a little bit confused by it. But now that Ava Labs is doing well, you know, when it kind of climbs up the rankings of largest coins, they start to get a better idea of, of what exactly it is or how large it is. A lot of people who are not technical, they might not exactly know, you know, what it is, but when they see market cap number or whatever the ranking is, they have a better idea. They're like, okay, wow, this is this is pretty legitimate. Um, so people are, you know, interested in it to say the least, uh, but not not too knowledgeable about it yet. And I think that's starting to change a little bit. Uh, but I think right now most people only know about Bitcoin, Ethereum, and a couple of others. And Avalanche is just starting to slide into that uh, that list of things that everybody kind of knows about if they, if they know anything at all about blockchain. Yeah, because of course money talks and our... Yeah. Uh, our network, our, our market cap increasing so much and us having that crazy week two weeks ago where we went up like 180% or something, those will help us cut through the noise in a big way. Um, out of everybody who's on the team now from Ava Labs, and there are more than a couple handfuls, who did you actually know on the ground at school? On the ground at school, you mean in classes or? You know, Steve or Stephen or Dan, did you take classes with anybody? No, no, I didn't know. Did I know anyone? No, I didn't know anyone at all, actually, until I joined the team. Got it. Okay. So um, give me your, your like blink instinct. The first time you met Goon, what was your just mm -hmm. blink instinct? Uh, what did you think about him? Honestly, he's just such a nice, charismatic guy. You know, he was so good to talk to. I think we talked about, we talked, uh, and I'll, I'll do it from like the first couple of conversations because it's hard to remember the exact first one. But, you know, within the first couple of conversations, he was telling me about uh, a Turkish, uh, I think it was Turkish Delight might have been the name, 
but like some Turkish dessert that he said I, I absolutely had to try. You know, he was telling me some stories about, I think it was kite surfing, which he apparently did some kite surfing on Cayuga Lake and saying that I had to try it, uh, which I still haven't done, but I've tried to do a couple of times. So, you know, advent, you know, just a, a great guy, uh, awesome to talk to, really happy, um, you know, just a fantastic guy to work with. Uh, yeah. yeah. Insanely knowledgeable. Um, to me, he has yeah. laser sharp intellects of anybody I've ever worked with. I've said this multiple times on this show before, but I really feel like you can tell he's been the professor at an Ivy League school for a long time because he will just instantly cut through any hand wavy bull crap and get right to the heart of the matter. So if you have a meeting with Goon, or especially if you have like an engineering all hands and there's a lot of people there, he will immediately cut through the hand waving if you're kind of like, oh, well, I was like, nope, you're not at it. Next. And so you just get the sense that he really doesn't, he's, he doesn't suffer fools kindly, I guess might be a way to say it. He just has a ferocious laser sharp intellect. He absolutely knows his stuff inside and out. I've compared him in the past to Eric Schmidt from Google. And I really do feel like um, that's a good analogy because for years I've been saying, I expect the next big startup to emerge from the blockchain space. And uh, one of our secret powers is simply that our C-level executives from Goon and John and Kevin and Ted, all four of those guys are serious players and they know their stuff inside and out. Ted recently just got his PhD from Cornell. I believe that Kevin is a PhD from Cornell. Obviously Goon is Goon. He created one of the very first proof of stake systems ever in, I'm sorry, uh, one of the very first proof of work systems ever in 2003, I believe called um, Karma. And so, yeah, that's cool. Um, whenever you met him, what were the very first projects you started working on with him? Yeah, the very first project that I started working on was going to be a desktop wallet. Uh, so I believe that it was based off of Electron. Um, so I was building a, a, you know, I kind of took a clone of this this, uh, this other wallet and I was supposed to hack it in order to support Avalanche because it had a, we didn't have this uh, VM subnet uh, dynamics at the time. So we just had one chain at the time and I was supposed to basically hack this wallet that was meant for uh, something else and basically make it compatible with uh, avalanche transactions so at the time uh, i started working on that you know basically uh, plopping in these components removing these ones and then changing things around a little bit uh, so i started working on that i guess at the very very beginning and i worked on it for a couple months until i got it to the point where it was working and then uh but you know i was never a front-end designer so it was working but it didn't look good um and so it was working but it didn't look good and so for some amount of time you know i was making small changes whenever, you know, it was still, Avalanche was still under development at the time. So there were changes to the transaction spec, things like that. And so it was working, but I had to make some changes and I was working on these changes to keep it compatible every once in a while. And eventually it got to the point where, you know, we hired um, Emre as the, the new developer for the actual wallet, which is, <laughs> I mean, my wallet was not suitable for, for public viewing and our wallet now is very, very nice, you know? So mine got thrown away and I started working the Avalanche platform at that point. Um, but that was the first project that I was working on. Wow. So you were there before we had subnets and other VMs. What was our first VM? Was it a DAG or a, a linear chain? I think the first VM was probably the AVM. Um, that would be my guess because it was originally Avalanche. What's up? Yeah, I was going to say that one makes sense to me because if you were refactoring Electron, which is a Bitcoin system, which has yep. UTXO, it would probably make sense mm -hmm. that the first virtual machine had UTXO, which is the Avalanche virtual machine. So that yep. was so that's pretty cool. So you saw the emergence of virtual machines and subnets. See, one of the great great things to me about Avalanche, um, Avalanche consensus is amazing, and it's a leap forward in the same way that Nakamoto consensus is amazing. But the Avalanche platform is just beautiful, man. It's got such a great architecture with the subnets and virtual machines. So you actually saw that emerge. Do you remember uh, what, what was the feeling like when that was emerging? Did it feel like it was overkill? Did you see the vision from day one? No, so at that time I was actually, I was a student at Cornell as well. So I was only working part-time. So my work on the platform at that point was you know, there was a little bug in consensus or something like that. And Steven, would, Steven the lead engineer on Avalanche since the very beginning, uh, you know, he would have a very clear idea of, all right, this is how to solve it. Um, I pretty much know how to solve it. It would probably take me two hours how to solve it. Aaron, take the next two weeks to figure out how to solve this based on me telling you exactly how to do it. And that was really how I started to become familiar with the consensus code and learn some of that. Um, 
So I wasn't actually involved in those discussions about VMs and subnets. They actually kind of manifested. I believe we were probably in the Brooklyn office at that point. So they manifested there when I was still in Ithaca and I really didn't get to see them up close and personal. But as they kind of manifest, I guess the first time that I really started to see it was when I started that next summer and I was working full time at that point. I, that, at that point, uh, subnets and VMs had already come together and it started to become pretty clear that, you know, this is a very, very interesting dynamic. This is a very interesting way to set things up so you can have this interaction between permission and permissionless uh, subnetworks. Um, and there was lots of, one of the interesting things, which I think this was right around the time that you were joining was all the different ways we thought about naming these things uh, to have a default subnet and oh, well, it's primary subnet and all these things and, you know, just getting it quite right so that, you know, it is one of the interesting things about it, I guess, is that it does add so many possibilities to Avalanche, but that also creates a lot of complexities for the user. And so getting the naming conventions right became, you know, it's not just about getting the most attractive name, it's making it so that people can wrap their heads around it as easily as possible. And so, you know, I think we did a pretty good job of that, but it's still something that we have to continue to explain. And I think as we continue to build products that really integrate subnets as, a, as like a first part of the experience, so that people can create a subnet very easily, create a virtual machine very easily. We're gonna to have to continue to have that dialogue to figure out exactly how to explain this so people can understand it as easily as possible. And, and also beyond understanding it as easily as possible, so that people who just use our products don't have to understand it at all, you know? So have that abstraction away from the user, um, so yeah. Got it, very cool. So you were, if I heard you correctly, engineer number four? Yep, I was an intern, but engineer number four. So, like, uh, do you have an appreciation for how epic that is? Like, are you able to? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty awesome. I'm pretty happy. <laughs> that's amazing, dude. That's historic. I mean, that, that's really cool. Is that your first job? Uh, it wasn't my first job. I had a couple before that, but it was, uh, it's certainly my coolest job, I got to say. <laughs> yeah, and so much potential. That's, that's really cool. Okay, so let's transition then into what you've worked on. So, um, so one of the things I've worked on with Aaron, and he really deserves the most of the credit because I'm learning Golang. My native tongue is really, I'm a web developer. I come from the web development space. I worked many years uh, as JavaScript. About three years ago, I transitioned to working with TypeScript full time. If you're doing web technology and most everybody's workflow touches the web in some way, um, even if it's just like a backend web service or like a command line tool or a front end GUI or whatever, the web is ubiquitous in a way that nearly everybody has to deal with it, whether they like it or not. And until um, WebAssembly is ubiquitous and we're able to have these new workflows where you can write in any language you want and just spit out a web app, um, nearly everybody has to use web tech. And if you're doing that and you are, you should be using TypeScript because TypeScript is such a radical leap forward from traditional JavaScript. Anybody who's ever worked with typed languages versus non-typed languages and know that typing just gives you an extra, it like it lets you think about your abstractions clearer. It gives you the tooling so that your abstractions don't buckle under the, uh, their own weight. And it makes your, uh, your development tooling come alive with being able to you know, catch errors and other files and autocomplete stuff and you get, um, you get you don't have to like compile your app to test errors um or you don't have to like run your app in real time to find errors just typescript is a huge 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 leap forward one of the things i'm on ramping into right now is golang so right now our tech stack at ava labs is pretty much go for um, the full node and some back-end services uh, front-end web tech would be like typescript and react and then we also use solidity of course because we're doing a lot of smart contract works on, on the evm so Aaron is a wizard compared to me with regards to Go. And one of the projects we work on together is we maintain what's called Avash. Avash is like the Ganache, uh, if you're familiar with Ganache from Ethereum, which it's a local development tool where you can spin up like a local blockchain and run your tests and your scripts against it. We have what's called Avash and Avash is written in Golang and it's one of the um, projects that we work on together. And, um, but I think and, and also you work on Avalanche Go a lot, but to me, your claim to fame is really core ETH. So um, am I, no, so there's a lot of, to unpack there. Am I correct that it's a fork of Geth? Um, have you been the primary engineer on that from day one? What, what, has, the, what has the core ETH story been? Yeah, so core ETH uh, goes back, it is actually not quite a fork of Geth. It is all borrowed code. Uh, so the original developer on this was, was Ted Yen. Uh, so one of the founders of the company. And so he actually took 
large parts of the code, but it wasn't like an exact fork. Uh, he borrowed the code that was necessary in order to get a bare bones virtual machine going using the EVM. And so virtual machine being the interface that our consensus engine requires to, to implement a state machine. Uh, and so that is, you know, using the snowman consensus protocol because that's meant for chains as opposed to direct acyclic graphs. Uh, so he took as little of the Go Ethereum code as possible to kind of keep it as minimal as possible uh, and then place that into, uh, into Cori and in order to implement that interface. And one of the difficulties with that was uh, Go has these weird um, visibility issues where the types, if you import it from a different package, it actually changes the type itself. So you can't actually pass in uh, a Cori type, even if it's the same as the Go Ethereum type into a function that takes it in. And so that caused us to have to migrate a lot more of the code over. Uh, so at this point, you know, it seems like if we had done it as a fork, it might've been a little bit easier. Um, but at, at this point, you know, we have it that way where we have some of the code is borrowed and some of it we still depend on Go Ethereum for it. And we do migrate in the updates from Go Ethereum, uh, you know, whenever they do a release. Just recently they had V1.10.8, which uh, they announced was going to include a, a critical security uh, vulnerability patch, which would have impacted us as well. So we obviously fixed that as soon as possible. We were actually on a call at 2 a.m., which was the release time for that, which was uh, a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> actually was a lot of fun, to be honest. So it's, those are exciting calls. Uh, but so I actually took over Corey from Ted when he was going back to, uh, I think, finish his PhD right after mainnet launch. Uh, and I became the, the lead dev at that point, fixing whatever issues came up with Corey as it started to take on more activity and also doing various optimizations to get it into a, into a better place uh, and building out new features. Um, yeah, you know, it's been a ride since then. And is it fair, to, is this an oversimplification or is this a fair uh, description of, of what Corey is? Corey is basically our instance or our implementation of the EVM, but instead of having Nakamoto consensus, it has snowman consensus. Yeah, so I would say that's, uh, it's almost ex exactly it. So that's, that's exactly what the, the idea of it is, is to rip out the EVM uh, and the block-based EVM. And, but instead of uh, making it just purely based on snowman consensus, it actually implements the RPC chain VM, which is our, our way for Avalanche Go to interact with uh, this other virtual machine in a separate process. And so the reason for that is actually because Go Ethereum has uh, a specific licensing requirement that we can't use their code in the same binary as Avalanche Go, the exact details of which completely elude me. Uh, but in order to comply with their license, we actually had to run this virtual machine in a separate, uh, in a separate binary, in a separate process. And so Corey is actually implementing that virtual machine interface. And it's not it is used to implement that RPC chain VM, but the, one of the very interesting things about not Avalanche consensus, but the way that we did that it was designed and kudos to Steven for having just amazing decoupling um, and just really, really very clean architectural design of this is that any other or almost any other consensus protocol could also use a very similar thing. They could use Cori in the same way and build their own consensus protocol on top of it. Uh, to some extent, you know, it is uh, specific to our consensus protocol in that the block uh, doesn't have any, some uh, in other consensus protocols, for example, Ethereum has a total or the difficulty and the total difficulty as part of the block. And so that implies that, you know, that is part of the consensus protocol itself. And for us, those fields aren't part of uh, the consensus protocol. So that does abstract away some of the information. Um, so, you know, uh, in Ethereum that causes their consensus protocol to be tightly coupled with the structure of the block itself because it contains some information that's critical to consensus. For us, that's not the case. And there are other consensus protocols where that's also not the case. Uh, so, you know, you could have uh, other consensus protocols come in and use Cori in the same way that we do. And they just designed one that would just use the virtual machine interface that we've designed. Um, so you're, you're absolutely right. It is uh, the implementation of the EVM as a, as a state machine that just complies with the virtual machine interface for Snowman. Um, and yeah. Okay, cool. So two things I'd like to unpack there. Can mm -hmm. you... Um, Explain the difference between Snowman and Avalanche, and then can you talk about the RPC chain VM? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Snowman and Avalanche are two different consensus protocols, but they're both proven in the Avalanche uh, paper. Actually, Snowman is actually, yeah, Snowman is technically proven in the Avalanche paper. Um, so Avalanche is uh, the Avalanche consensus protocol, which applies to a directed acyclic graph, uh, which if you're familiar with computer science basically means that it's a graph where there are no cycles. So directed, and acyclic. Um, and so that's become a more popular structure for some blockchains in, in recent years. And so that's what Avalanche is based on. 
Snowman, on the other hand, is a, is a linear chain. And so the when you're doing consensus for Avalanche, you have to take into account that it's a DAG. Uh, and so you have slightly different considerations. The vertices in the DAG actually contain transactions and you have to do consensus on those to make sure that there are no conflicts. So it's this UTXO based thing where you actually have to make sure that if a vertex is accepted, uh, the transactions in it have all been accepted and that none of those transactions conflict with another vertex that you accept or might accept in the future. Um, so there's a slightly different dynamic there. Uh, and Snowman is uh, simplifies to only a linear chain, which means that each block can only have one child and each child can only have one parent. Uh, so what that means is that it simplifies it a lot. It's, it's much, much simpler Snowman than Avalanche. And the reason for that is uh, defining what is a conflict, which is a difficult problem and a huge part of consensus is incredibly simple in Snowman. And the reason for that is if you have two blocks of the same height, they conflict, that's it, that's the end of the story. And so it's very, very easy to define as opposed to with Avalanche where you have uh, conflict sets are much more complicated. So that's the difference between um, Avalanche and Snowman. And so to, to clarify again, Corey lives on top of Snowman. And the reason for that is the EVM is obviously a block-based protocol and we have to have ordering of the transactions that are processed by the EVM in order to make it so that they can all access whatever state they want. And there's not gonna be any kind of conflicting rights to state, which could lead to some kind of non-deterministic behavior. And there's very interesting research into finding ways to kind of parallelize that computing to some extent. There are other protocols that try and do that. Um, so that's a very interesting avenue of research for the future. But for right now, we just use the same block-based protocol as Ethereum. Uh, and then going back to your question about the RPC chain VM. So this is how Avalanche plans to implement, uh, to create new virtual machines uh, that are separate from the Avalanche Go repo. So obviously uh, we can have a new virtual machine implemented within Avalanche Go and it can run natively within the same process. But aside from that, what we can also do is we can use this RPC chain VM to allow anyone to implement a virtual machine and it just spins up this, uh, this process uh, that basically starts a gRPC server and uh, can respond to any request to the, that the VM interface has. So it'll respond to initialize the virtual machine with this genesis data, this state, this context, so on and so on, or parse this block, retrieve this block from storage, um, verify that this block is valid, so on and so on. Uh, and so it just allows anyone to, to use that interface. So if you wanted to implement um, Monero, for example, you could do that as, by implementing a new virtual machine and the RPC chain VM is split up into a, a server and a client. So the client is the part that Avalanche Go uses to basically send requests to the, the virtual machine server, which is where Corey or another uh, virtual machine would live. Uh, and so that basically responds with the, the whatever the response is. And it tells you, okay, this block was valid or okay, here's the block, here it's defining features and that allows the, the consensus protocol to uh, move on from there with, with that information while it's still in two separate processes. So that kind of opens it up so that anybody can create and maintain a virtual machine in their own separate repo. And it also, you know, it allows us to kind of keep those things separate so we can have versioning schemes so that those aren't necessarily coupled very tightly with how Avalanche consensus works and how Avalanche Go works. People can actually maintain their own virtual machines separately is kind of the vision for that. Got it. So the RPC chain VM allows people to implement virtual machines that operate in a separate process than uh, Go, or is, I guess the main Avalanche Go um, process. Mm -hmm. um, also, am I correct that one of the benefits of the RPC chain VM is that you do not have to implement your virtual machine in Golang, as long as your language can implement this certain RPC interface, you can basically implement your virtual machine in a whole host of languages, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. As long as they can communicate over gRPC, which you know you can implement that in any program language really, uh, you can implement that exact same thing and it's just inner process communication. So they can, very, yeah, you can very easily implement a new one in Rust or something like that. Very cool. So that's going to be a huge enabler. Obviously, Golang is an amazing language, but there's plenty of other amazing languages. And if we can open up the ability for all these people to speak in their native tongue, whatever that is, Java, C++, Rustlang, um, we're going to see an absolute explosion. I'm of the opinion that um, virtual machines are they're, they're not hype. There is really something big here. And I believe this is going to be the catalyst for a renaissance in blockchain technology. I'm really excited for virtual machines to take off. Again, correct me if I'm wrong here, but technically speaking, virtual machines are live today. You can launch a virtual machine on the mainnet in your own subnet. Um, what we do not have yet are permissionless subnets. So as a validator, you have to whitelist a um, 
subnet and the subnet actually has to whitelist your validators. So it's not yet permissionless. And then another thing we don't have yet is cross subnet asset transfers. So today, you know, you can move assets back and forth between the CP and the X chain on our default subnet, but we want to get it to where you can move assets back and forth across different subnets. That's all correct. Yes. Uh, so, I th so there are three points in there, right? So it's um, so cross subnet transactions is the last one. I'll, I'll go backwards. So I try and remember them and correct me if I'm leaving anything out. So you're absolutely right. Cross subnet transactions we don't have yet. And again, this is going to, like you said, this is going to be a huge piece of the, of the subnet architecture is if we have these different subnets, but we don't have a way to transfer value between them, then that's, that's kind of a missing piece because the really big thing about this vision is the ability to have these disparate different subnets where people can implement whatever they want, whatever they need on top of permissionless or permissions uh, subnetworks, and then still be part of the same ecosystem. So that, you know, you can avoid a huge amount of the friction that comes from, you know, you have to implement your own consensus protocol, then you have to build bridges to other asset bearing networks so you can uh, really create a connected ecosystem. Uh, so cro yeah, cross subnet transactions is currently missing. That's gonna be a huge, huge benefit when we, when we have that. Um, and then going back to the last one, could you remind me what that was? Permissionless subnets. Yep. So we, we do actually have permissionless subnets right now. Uh, the one thing is right now, it is a little bit difficult to, to use uh, the subnet features. Um, you know, one of the very first blockchains that was created is Doc Suck, they have no help. Uh, and that was because we hadn't actually built quite the best subnet experience for, for users yet. Uh, so what you mentioned was with the yeah, whitelisted subnets, the way that it works now is we actually realized that there was a vulnerability a, a while back when it's been patched now. But there was a vulnerability where if somebody sent a transaction adding uh, your validator as a subnet validator, then they would just start validating it, which could mean that, you know, if somebody created a different uh, subnet, you, you would just immediately start validating. And then if they started spamming that and if it was, you know, a virtual machine where there are no transaction fees and didn't have like DOS protection, then people could force your validator to validate a bunch of things that it has no interest in. So we actually have to make it so that it can still be permissionless. You just have to opt into it. So you as the node uh, validator, you can still participate in these permissionless networks where anyone can join, but you need to submit a transaction so that you choose to validate it. Um, and if somebody sends another transaction and says, hey, I want to add this person as a validator to my subnet, but they have no interest in validating it, then like their hardware isn't going to do that work for you with validating it. That potentially, you know, if they're running a specific plug-in VM, they might not even have the code to run it. So uh, it's still, we still have the capability to do permissionless subnets. It's just that it has to be through an opt-in process. So you have to choose which subnets you want to validate, uh, both for permissionless and permission networks. Um, and then what was the, the first point that you brought up? Going in reverse order, sorry. I don't know that it even was even a question. I think I was just commenting that it's going to be incredibly enabling that we can allow people to not just use Golang because there's so many yeah. other developers out there and their native tongue is just not Go. So being able to have them spin up virtual machines and C++ or wrestling is I think going to be uh, incredibly empowering, incredibly exciting as well. Um, yeah, I was wondering, you, you mentioned, can you give a sense of why would somebody use a DAG data structure versus a linear chain data structure? Yeah, so the idea of the DAG is that, oh, uh, did you get a little feedback there or is that just me? Just you, I think. Okay, um, it went away, so I think it's okay. Uh, but so the idea of the DAG is that it's parallelizable. You know, with a chain, you have, you know, just one block and you can only build one block on top of that. So if you try and build two blocks, they obviously immediately conflict. So the idea is that with a DAG, you have like one vertex is the accepted frontier and anybody that wants to can build a vertex on top of it. And as long as those different vertices don't contain transactions that conflict with each other, all of those vertices can be valid. So in Avalanche, you have uh, a greater ability to parallelize the uh, parallelize transactions and vertices through consensus. So that's that's really the idea there. And so if you have something where you don't need um, a completely linear chain, then the DAG offers some interesting things for you. And what are those use cases? Like the ones that come to my mind are DAGs are good for peer-to-peer -peer payments, linear chains are good for smart contracts. Is that an oversimplification? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, so I think, a uh, DAG is good for anything where you don't need that full linearizability. So, but your example is right, you know, for a peer-to-peer -peer payment network uh, where it's just UTXO based like the AVM is, you don't need to have a complete linearizability. Uh, Avalanche consensus is perfectly capable of handling conflicting transactions on uh, different vertices and handling that so that only one of the transactions will be accepted. Uh, you know, so it's, it's perfectly fine to do that. And you don't need that linearizability. You don't need to have, okay, well, this transaction occurred before this one, you know, it's fine. Like these two are in vertices, they both have the same parent. 
um, and they have transactions that are completely virtuous. There are no conflicts between them. Uh, so there's not necessarily a need for it. And so if you have that, then you have a little bit higher scalability. You know, you can support a little bit higher transactions per second, which is obviously a number everyone loves to, to talk about. Um, so, you know, if you don't need linearizability, then you can build it on top of DAG. Uh, and so that might offer you higher performance that might be of interest to you. Uh, whereas if you have, you know, the existing EVM relies on this block-based structure where, you know, you have transaction A and transaction B, and both are trying to send some money to, or do some trade on Uniswap, obviously one impacts the other. And so for that, you need to have uh, linearizability, like which one came first in order to decide, well, if this one comes first and that uh, changes the price that uh, this next one is going to pay. And so you have to have a clear way of deciding uh, which one came first. And so the way that you do that is the transactions are ordered within the block and blocks are obviously on a totally ordered basis too. Um, whereas if it were in a DAG and you had these two transactions in two separate vertices, they both have the same parent then it would be ambiguous which one comes first. And so you would have to have some way to clearly define the total ordering there or another way of handling it. Okay, um, coming that, so that leads me to a question that we got from uh, Twitter. Mm -hmm. Somebody, Mr. Hello says, is the platform team working on parallelization of the EVM? If I recall correctly, there has been some promising work there as of late. Uh, yeah. Not right now, but uh, I'm actually recently read a couple of papers about it. So definitely a very interesting field. I'm thinking about it myself, um, but I, we're not working on it internally right now. No. Got it. So what do you think has been the most challenging part about working on the C chain? That's a very good question. That's a very difficult question. There's been lots of challenges. <laughs> um, I think the most difficult part might be just responding to things as, as quickly as possible when they occur. You know, I think uh, with any team, you know, with, with young engineers, as, as Avalabs is a team of pretty young engineers, people don't necessarily have a huge amount of experience going through vulnerabilities that come up, you know? And so me personally, I'm one, I think I might be the youngest uh, engineer on the team. Uh, and so for me personally, I don't have a long history of working at different places that had these different things come up and, you know, be able to fix them. So each one of these at the beginning, they seem like, oh my God, how are we, how are we going to handle this? This is a critical thing and we have to fix it. And as you, as I've kind of gone on, you know, I realized like these things do happen as I've met more people from other, other teams. And also one of the big uh, people that's come in and kind of uh, brought a lot of order to, to it is, has been Patrick O'Grady who came over from Coinbase. Uh, so yeah. Um, and so Patrick came over and, you know, he had a lot of experience with that where things go wrong everywhere you know things are always going wrong and the challenge that every engineering org at org organization has is not to do things perfectly because that is impossible and there's nobody in the world that does it the challenge that every team has uh and the challenge that defines the engineering team is responding to them as quickly as possible and so realizing that that was the critical step and not 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 making mistakes but responding to them as quickly as possible has been one of the big challenges because that's something that you know these Every time something like this happens, we all jump on a call and we all try to solve it as quickly as possible. And so in order to do that, you know, there's a massive amount of teamwork. There's a massive amount of coordination that takes place. And also to roll these things out, it's, uh, it's you know, these critical things and just kind of accepting that this is the process that we have to do as opposed to seeking perfection, but responding to emergencies uh, well. And I think we've done a, a very good job of that. But, you know, as with anything, those are always high, high pressure situations, which are, you know, always fun too. Uh, but they're fun at the end, I would say. <laughs> so that's yeah. definitely been one of the biggest challenges. Yeah, I want to give a shout out to Patrick O'Grady. So he's our VP of engineering. Um, as Aaron mentioned, he came over from Coinbase, where I believe he was the lead of the Rosetta project. Yep. And um, I just, I have so much respect for Patrick. He truly is a wizard as well. He's the right dude for the job, really. Out of everybody who was on our engineering team, I think he was the right person to become the VP of engineering. He's not only very good, um, from an engineering perspective, but he's also very disciplined and very easy to get along with. He has a very extreme breadth and depth of knowledge, so he can deep dive on a lot of different topics, and he's helped debug and unwind some pretty gnarly knots that I've seen him um, go through. <laughs> so I just have a ton of respect from him. Um, so diving in a little bit on the technical side of the uh, C-chain, so something everybody's been very excited about is ARC-20s. And so um, basically, uh, like a, an ERC-20 is a um, like an interface that's, you know, big in the Ethereum ecosystem. It's what really led to an explosion of um, the crowd sales and the token sales we see. And so really it emerged from the fact that Ethereum was so expressive that there was just an explosion of tokenization 
but standards and interoperability are what enable things to really go big. And if we want the blockchain to be as, um, you know, as meaningful as the web and beyond, really what we need are standards for interoperability so that everybody can go do their own thing, but everybody's still on the same page. So something that people just don't totally yet understand are um, our 20s. And so this person says, um, what is technically required to allow smart contracts to mint new ARC-20 supply? Yeah, so uh, I guess I'll give a little bit of background here on what ARC-20s are, the vision behind them and how they work to, to answer the question. So an ARC-20 is basically, it's an ERC-20 contract that implements the exact same interface. And the one difference is an ARC-20 contract is actually wrapping some asset that is native to the Avalanche platform. So it's not just a smart contract that has, you know, just it's stored in the smart contract. And, you know, when you interact with it, that smart contract maintains your balance. This, it actually has a balance of uh, some asset that's basically come over from the X chain. And so these assets that are minted and created on the X chain, we call them avalanche native tokens or ants for short. Uh, so these ants, they need to be transferred over to the C chain. Uh, and so those can be transferred over. And when they are, they're actually stored on the, the user's account balance. So if it's uh, you transfer to address one, for example, uh, with a smart contract or an ERC-20, the contract itself actually maintains the balances for all of the users, all of the keys that actually own it. Uh, whereas with uh, an Avalanche native token, when it gets transferred to the C chain, it's actually uh, that specific address that it, it, within its storage within uh, the EVM, that's where that balance is actually stored. Um, but the thing is, that's actually not how things typically work in the EVM, right? That actually doesn't provide you the greatest interface to work with. And so originally we didn't have uh, very good ways to interact with those assets once they were transferred to the C chain. And one of the things that we added was pre-compiled contracts uh, to allow you to, to move those assets around within a smart contract. Uh, so those are basically give you this ability to treat them the same way that you would treat ETH or the native asset of, uh, of Ethereum or in the, uh, the case of the C chain of Vox. Uh, and so what that means is that you can atomically call uh, a smart contract while also transferring some amount of that asset. And that actually became critically important when we wanted to have these wrapped assets so you could deposit them into a smart contract. Uh, so what that means is, if you want to, you, basically they're a wrapper contract similar to, to WET or WABOX. Uh, and so those assets, what they do is, you know, you send ETH to some, to some smart contract or you send a VOX to the WABOX contract. And that basically says like, all right, we received, the contract basically says, I received five VOX from Aaron. So now Aaron has a balance of five WABOX. And that basically entitles me to withdraw five, uh, five AVOX from the WABOX contract. And so that contract is actually custodying my asset uh, for me. And so uh, it is actually holding it. Like I no longer hold a Vox, but the Vox contract now says that I have some account balance with them. And so that uh, allows it to implement that ERC-20 contract. And so, it, you know, er, that allows you to interact with ETH in a way that implements the ERC-20 contract. So interesting thing about Ethereum is that, you know, ETH, the native asset, uh, predated the ERC-20 token standard. So there was, you know, you had to create a way for people that wanted to build the ERC-20 token standard, but interact with Ethereum, you had to develop a smart contract that allowed you to do that. So you needed to create an ERC-20 wrapper that held ETH. Um, so Wavox does the same thing and ARC-20s do the same thing for Avalanche native tokens besides a box. And basically the reason that you have a need for um, it to be treated differently besides a box is that when you do a normal contract call within the EVM, uh, it passes in some value to the, to the contract, or you can pass in some value to the contract and has a native understanding that, you know, there's a value that's being passed in. Whereas with, uh, these other, uh, these other pre-compiled contracts, there, there's no EVM opcode that allows you to say transfer, uh, like Scooby coin, which was a coin that I created very early on and nobody uses, but I, I think did you give your son to your son. Scooby bags. Yeah, I gave some to my son. I got Scooby bags. <laughs> okay. So it still exists still out there. Um, but yeah, so Scooby, uh, if you know, you have Scooby coin, you want to transfer that to the C chain, uh, when you do a contract call to basically try and transfer that from, you know, or from Gabriel, if you try and transfer that to your son, you need to have the way to transfer that on the C chain. And so you have to use one of those pre-compiled contracts. Um, you can't just use the call opcode, which is how most people use it. And that's, that's how all EVM smart contracts basically works with that call opcode, how they interact with each other. So we needed to create an interface where people could atomically transfer those avalanche native tokens so, and also call a smart contract. And the reason that's 100% required is, you know, if those if you can't do those two things atomically, then you open yourself to vulnerabilities where let's say, I want to deposit some of my Scooby coin into an ARC20 contract. So I send it to the contract 
And then I have to separately tell it I just deposited the funds. So those are two separate actions. And there's a race, there's a potential race condition where I deposit the funds uh, or I send the funds in. But before I can say, hey, I deposited the funds, please credit my account. Somebody else can say, hey, you have more Scooby coin now. I, I deposited that, like that was me. And so somebody can kind of front run my like second transaction and say, try and take credit for the amount that I sent in. So you really have to have a way to couple those two things so that either they both go through at the same time or it doesn't happen. Uh, so you can actually do deposits safely. Um, and so finally getting to your question of what is the requirement for an ARC-20 to mint more of a token is an ARC-20 is, is it, you can't mint it, you have to just wrap it. So basically the way that it works is you need to deposit some amount of the Avalanche native token that you're attempting to wrap into that contract and then it can increment the account balances. Uh, so if you, on the other hand, try to just mint more of that ARC-20 token, let's say there's 100 Scooby coin in the Scooby coin wrapper contract, and then that contract, let's say it just mints 10 Scooby coin, but it hasn't actually increment the balance. Then you now have a discrepancy where that contract thinks it has 110 Scooby in existence, but it only actually has 100 of the underlying asset. So if it uh, receives calls for withdrawals of the full 110, then it doesn't actually have enough assets to back it up. So it breaks the uh, breaks the idea of the contract there. Okay, got it. Um, so we are now five minutes away, four minutes away from the hour. I want to be very respectful of Aaron's time. I know he's got plans this evening. So there were still a couple more questions related to the EVM, but unfortunately, I don't think we'll get to them. Perhaps we can uh, follow up a dialogue on Twitter or something. I think sort of just to wrap it out, I want to... Um, move to the third sort of chapter of this talk, and that is to kind of just get your crypto vision. So I would wonder like, first off, um, on the whole avalanche journey, so what have been like some of the highlights and some of the lowlights? What would you, what have we done really well and what would we have done, what would you have done different? And then um, the final part is just like, where, what is your crypto vision? How big do you see this getting? Do you see the blockchain being as transformative as the web and beyond, which is what I commonly say, or, um, do you think it'll just be bucketed to finance or do you think smart contracts really have way more transformative? So the good, the bad and the ugly of the journey so far, and then what is your crypto vision? So I'll start out with the good because that seemed like the most fun. So I would say that the, the good as you know, me and you have kind of echoed throughout this call and I'm sure everyone else has echoed throughout the, this, uh, this series is you know just building the team that we have. It is just absolutely amazing. And every time I talk to anybody else in the Avalabs team about the team that we built, people talk about, just how amazing it is. And, you know, me, this is one of my very first jobs, you know, I haven't worked at a large number of places, uh, but it is very clearly special, you know, being around people that are very, very driven and believe in what they're doing, trying to create a product that's actually going to impact the world, um, building things uh, that they're interested in, not just because of the impact on the world, but also because they're so interesting technically. So just the amount of commitment that this team has to getting things done, getting them done right. Uh, and then also creating interesting products, the amount of commitment that we have to building out this community, both with normal community members who are just users and also with third party partners and exchanges and whatnot uh, is just amazing. And, you know, I've talked with so many other people on the team who say, you know, this is maybe it's not, you know, this is one of my, uh, not my first job, but one of my first jobs in technology. And they'll say, you know, this is my 20th job or something like that. That's a higher of a number than it actually is, but, you know, they've been around for a while and it's very clear that everybody is in, pretty much, you know, everyone kind of agrees, this is a pretty special place to work just with the amount of commitment that everyone has and everything I just mentioned. So I think in terms of building the team, whether that's coming from Goon's connections within crypto and just the connections from Cornell and just everything, you know, I think we've done a fantastic job of building a great team. And that really makes the rest of the, makes the rest of it work, you know, because we have the right people to respond to whatever comes up, to, to build a new feature, to fix the bug, to respond to the situation as quickly as possible. Um, and then also, you know, to enjoy being around each other because we work very long hours. Uh, so very important there too. Um, and then I guess things I would do differently, I'd have to think more about it. So if it's okay with you, I'll skip that one for another time. Uh, and then I guess the other part was the crypto vision. Um, I'm a big believer in something that Goon said to me. Actually, I think the very first conversation that we had, I remember this was the very first conversation I had with Goon was there is... And I might have the numbers wrong, but something like seven trillion dollars of assets in the world, probably more now than it was then. Uh, but you know, if there's seven trillion dollars of assets in the world, and uh, actually, there must, must be much more than that. And there's uh, you know some amount of that is in crypto. 
there's so many financial frictions in the world. There's so many assets that are not liquid. There's so many people that are underserved financially that there is just such a high potential to put that into a, into a system that has a higher capability of, of serving those people, of creating financial assets and instruments uh, that are more liquid that create better products. So one example I would say is, you know, loans to, to people in countries that are uh, historically under, underserved. You know, a lot of the time, the reason that they're underserved is that they're higher risk. And you don't have a way to like very easily package those and have people invest in them, but they offer, you know, higher interest rates and they might still uh, be underserved. But if we can kind of create a way for people to bundle those very easily, for example, on blockchain, create new products, uh, new financial products, you can serve those communities better. Um, and additionally, beyond that, if you can uh, create more liquidity by kind of bundling those products in interesting ways so you can sell them to investors, you can create not only just uh, do more matchmaking between loans and people who need them, but also create secondhand markets that you have more liquidity with those and increase demand. You know, I'm not uh, a proponent of like repeating what happened in 2008 or anything like that, but there is a huge argument to be made for the ability of blockchains to reduce financial frictions in the world. And just with the amount of assets that exist and the amount of financial frictions that exist, I think blockchain has a huge potential role to play in alleviating those frictions and making the world uh, a better place for the people who are underserved financially um, and yeah, just, uh, reducing those frictions that everyone can have a, an equal shot and make the financial system a little bit more efficient. So, you know, right now there's so many inefficiencies in it. Got it. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I think we'll probably draw it to a close now. I just really want to express gratitude to Aaron. And I just want to say like, from me to you, man, I, I really think you're an amazing engineer. I see tons of potential in you. I'm quite positive you're gonna have an amazing career and have a really big impact on the world. You already have, you're a very young man. Like <laughs> what lies ahead of you, like really, man, it's an honor to work with you and um, I enjoy it. Thank you so much for your time. Um, thanks everybody. If you made it this far, you're an absolute champion. This has been another uh, edition of the Subnet Show. I am Gabriel Cardona, I'll give, um, a shout out to Connor. Hope you're doing well, mate. I know you're pulling off something huge tonight. So um, thanks everybody for joining from um, Snowflake to Avalanche and through consensus to the stars. Thank you, everybody. Cheers. <laughs>